mentioned on topic in public house. So I think it's quite uh, great and beautiful to see uh, through this uh, <coughs> class, they are like in production to public house, to see that different topics that they are on in public house. So Chester Bundy Street is talking about safe food and farms. So again, this is another thing that you are realizing, oh, how we are regulating this, what is the public house policy about that? It's part of public house profession. Uh, if we think about, like, do we really, is it really like regulations or public house policy about food? Is it part of the public house? Yes, of course it is, because uh, in the beginning when we talk about infectious diseases, now we are here again uh, as uh, foodborne illnesses. And this is a little bit review for you, because you are already familiar with bacteria, viruses, parasites. Remember, there were also questions on the midterm in that time making the connection uh, if this name it's connected with bacteria or viruses so now you can see the purpose what I did in the beginning uh, of the class because now um, you can see the connection with that so yes uh, there is the problem with the foodborne illnesses and yes it's the public health provider uh, they need to take care of that why we are worrying about that from public health perspectives because if you can see just on the slide talking about bacteria so that can be a foodborne illness connected with salmonella from different type of the food. Uh, e. coli, uh, if you are um, reading newspapers, so from time to time you can see like while well, there is the problem with the E. coli in this type of the food. Sometimes it's um, uh, plant food, uh, sometimes it's the package of spinach and uh, there is now recall uh, getting back, yes, this is the warning because there was possible to see the connection with E. coli. Mostly uh, the bacteria and the foodborne illnesses are uh, connected or could be connected with uh, animal type of food. If it's happened with the plant food is maybe because uh, do you have any ideas why it could be connection with the plant type of the food uh, connection with the E. coli? Maybe, of course, it's the, where is the uh, part, where is the uh, agriculture part that they are producing the spinach? Is it close to the farms? Is it that maybe the animals could be infected there? Or if it's the uh, spinach that is sold as a package in the plastic bags. So is maybe, do we need as a public health providers to check if the person who is packaging that uh, plastic bags with the plant food, if uh, they are healthy? or maybe there is risk that they are transferring the disease. So therefore, you as a public health provider, uh, you will be implementing the public health policy, uh, what is the environment on that uh, farms, and also what type of people are working and are connected with the food. So they need also to go uh, regularly st uh, through um, medical checkups also to find out if that could be transmission or the person is infected without the symptoms, but could transfer the disease. So it's very important, I mean, if you look on that and you think like, wow, this is great, this is really public health infrastructure. It's so uh, beautiful that you know what I'm eating, I'm not getting sick after that. And uh, so maybe some of you have that experience traveling in different countries that you have to be very uh, aware or it's also when you go through the CDC and I hope you go to CDC to check whatever country if you are traveling, what kind of vaccination, what are the precautions that that you need to do uh, whatever places that you are traveling because sometimes it's recommendation uh, not to eat the food from uh, from the vendors that they are um, selling the foods on the street because you don't know if all of these uh, requirements uh, they are keeping all the requirements in order to have the healthy food and not uh, having any contamination uh, any of you have experience with uh, travel diarrhea going to different countries yeah so this is not comfortable, is it right? <laughs> so uh, that's, that's the, well, the natural thing is because you are changing the environment. So that can be connected with that things on, on its own, but it, sometimes it could be increased because it can be the contamination of the food. So it's very important to, uh, to um, from the public health perspectives to be sure that we are checking that everything is healthy for the public. Um, with the water also, it's the same uh, in some areas, it's not possible, even it's the tap water, 
uh, you cannot drink it as a tap water. You have to drink uh, water from the bottle. So it's not uh, the bottle. Uh, the water is not safe because maybe there is the contamination. Uh, so that experience um, very frequently I have when I was traveling different countries. I was traveling, for example, um, Central America. So only two countries that you can drink the tap water that will be Costa Rica or Panama, some specific areas. But if you are in Guatemala and you are thinking, yes, I'm going to the restaurant, there is a, a beautiful restaurant and everything, and you are thinking, I will have the salad there. Uh, I would probably have a little bit precautious with that because you don't know if it's really uh, washed by drinkable, I mean, the water from the bottle, the drinkable water, or just the tap water. Sometimes the people living there, they develop some kind of uh, immune system for that, that uh, uh, they cannot get quickly uh, and easily sick uh, from some of that uh, contamination. But they uh, usually, uh, when I talk with the public there, when I was there, usually like once or twice a year, they are. Uh, um, you know, regularly sick from some of the contamination, some of that may be forms that they didn't have developed the immune system. So if you think about that, uh, I know uh, you think like what, you are not so much thinking about that, oh, can I get sick uh, or infectious disease from the food because it's already public health infrastructure is developed and it's like standard, it's like normal things, but uh, it's not always in that way in other countries. So therefore we have to have public health providers to taking care of this. So uh, viruses, hepatitis A, many of that um, infectious diseases uh, like hepatitis is a now we have the vaccination also but um, just 10 years ago there was or 15 years ago there was not vaccination for hepatitis a and hepatitis a it's the type of the disease that you can get um, it's quite connected uh, very close with the food so what was possible in that time to have the vaccine to have the immunization with um, uh, immunoglobulin, so it was the IgG that was for working like for six months and increasing the uh, the antibodies and immune system. Um, but um, still, it was not uh, the protection like it's the vaccination that now we have that. So. Even if you have that and even if you travel to different countries, it's very important to be uh, aware that uh, it depends what kind of public health uh, infrastructure they have there. So here we are talking a little bit about government uh, and about the public health infrastructure. That was something what I was sharing to you before. So FDA uh, and USDA, so they are two agencies that they are taking care and uh, protecting the public from uh, contamination from the food. Um, it's a little bit more on the, I mean, when we will be talking a little bit about uh, paradoxical things or controversies in that is that FDA, uh, they have to do huge amount of work. They have to have also policies for the, because it's uh, the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, it's still the talk that maybe you USDA, they have a little bit more money and they spend less of uh, uh, checking on the type of the food. So they think that they should be observing or uh, controlling a uh, higher amount. So that can be a little bit less work of the FDA because they are overwhelmed now. Uh, here also the things about the state and local, gov uh, local government regulate stores, restaurant, uh, schools, nursing houses, so uh, nursing homes. So this is something that we already talked in the beginning also of this class. So this is again very important uh, when you will be as a public health provider. So you will be also regularly going to the restaurants and checking if they are keeping the public health policy, if they are keeping all the regulations, how they are handling the food, uh, uh, that screening also the employees there so that they are healthy. Because if this is done, then it's uh, safe to, uh, for the public to go to the restaurants and eat the food. Uh, this is something what I mentioned before about the two systems, about the USDA and FDA. Uh, so please remember this one. Definitely there will be the question on the final exam, the differences uh, between that USDA and FDA. And uh, also that could be a little bit more uh, responsibility relocated a little bit to USDA to be more involved in that part. 
So what are the safety measures? Um, again, it was uh, necessary to develop, uh, uh, it's very important to do the surveillance also, it was necessary to develop the public health policy, uh, it was necessary to develop like technological approach, what can be done in order to prevent the risk uh, getting sick from the foodborne illnesses. So there are different forms. We talk about the pasteurization, like pasteurization of the milk. Uh, so also the, the place how there are specific regulations uh, to keep the sanitation, hygiene, and uh, additional um, uh, process, how we can keep the food um, you know, safe. Uh, additives, contaminants, uh, you would be probably thinking like, oh, this is also connected with public health. Yes, of course. Uh, the FDA also have the regulations to tell the companies uh, what type of uh, additives could be there. Again, here we are talking about the challenging uh, part uh, in public health again, because uh, sometimes the, uh, the <clears throat> the people that they are in the business uh, with the food, so they would like to keep the food as long as possible on the shelves. So sometimes they are giving the additives that uh, they probably, we, are not, we were not in the beginning so sure if they are really healthy or not. So therefore it was necessary to done the regulations to prevent that, uh, and remember we talk about the social justice and market justice, so that will be not market justice uh, increased, so it means it will be not just giving the additives to have profit for the companies uh, and it will be not it will be the risk for the house for the public so what type of additives uh, it's the, based on the regulations of FDA so there are specific uh, <coughs> forums and specific regulations that what can be allowed and everything needs to be uh, not toxic of course and not doing any harm to the public um, when you look on that uh, hormones, antibiotics, uh, when there are also specific regulations, what could be the level of the hormones or what could be the level of the antibiotics. Now, uh, when you are buying, for example, like milk or some products, it's written there like um, the animal were not treated with antibiotics or uh, the hormones were not used. So it's very important <coughs> that this information the public will know also. So they will know <coughs> what they are buying, what is the product. Uh, in the beginning, when it started, so they were thinking like, especially at the animal farms, well, the setting of the animal farms, farms is in the way that uh, a lot of animals are together in the small uh, place. And of course, it's higher risk to get the diseases. So many times uh, the animals were receiving uh, antibiotics in order to prevent any infectious diseases. But uh, through the years, it was possible to find out that these antibiotics, the traces, are in that product and people are consuming that. Plus, it was increasing the risk for resistance for antibiotics. So they are based on that experiences also and on that research, uh, it was developed um, the public health policy to changing that uh, and giving some specific regulations uh, to the animal farms. Um, if you think about organic food, uh, so this is again, um, it, you have the year like 2004. So before that, it was not completely standardized. Uh, from that time, there is now specific rules. And if you see that the food has the stamp and it's like uh, organic and it's certified by USDA. So it means that the company or that the farm, they need to follow the specific regulations. If you travel to different countries, uh, it depends what is the development of the public health infrastructure. Um, because I'm originally from Czech Republic, so at this moment this is like not completely controlled. So it's, uh, they still know if there is the stamp about organic food. It's not yet supervised by one um, health uh, agency or health organization. So it's not completely still sure that yes, if it's stamp is there, is it really organic or not? Or what about 
about the pesticides. Uh, maybe it's just antibiotics and, and hormones, but maybe pesticides are allowed. So it's not yet they are trying to find and define um, the definition about the organic food. So you cannot always think immediately, it depends on the countries, um, if there will be the organic stamp, if it's really uh, responding to the organic type of food. Most Western countries, yes, some of that uh, post-communist uh, time, it's not always uh, sure, so because they are just trying to find that proper way in that. So then sometimes, of course, you have additives that uh, they also like uh, the, per the company uh, or the store, if they are selling the food, they would like that the food looks also good. So you can have the, uh, some of the additives that they are helping with the color of the food or they are helping with uh, keeping the, uh, the life on the shelves. But again, it must be in the way that it's not doing any harm uh, to the public and uh, it's not having any tox uh, toxic effect and there are specific regulations. In some countries uh, it's still not completely regulated and again I'm going back to Czech Republic you would be thinking like oh we need really to have public health providers <laughs> in Czech Republic. Um, a few uh, I think it was probably one or two years uh, ago that was the huge problem what I was reading um, on the news that um, the owners of the store they were adding additives that uh, to the meat so the meat was still able to have like a, a nice red color but it was already uh, you know in the stages of um, not um, able to consume anymore so it was in the stages of the being like rotten meat but uh, it got the color and people got sick after that so that was huge in one of that city suddenly uh, they received the patients in the medical facilities and they again you use the epidemiology uh, to try to find out uh, where and what and how and everything and so they were able to find out, yes, this was the contamination of the meat uh, that people were receiving from that specific store. So this is something that um, needs to, the regulations needs to be done. And you as a public health providers, you have to go there. Usually when you go to different places, you go, uh, they don't know that you are coming. You are just coming there and uh, checking the public health policy. So if you think about that, it's really, really important because otherwise you as a consumer uh, in the store, there is no other way how you can control that, how you will know what you are buying. It's really healthy and without any additives. So again, here is FDA and USDA uh, under the, of course, umbrella of public health, trying to keep the public healthy. Uh, about drugs and about medication, uh, just yesterday evening, I have the class, the uh, drug abuse and its prevention, and we talk a little bit about um, the over-the-counter uh, medication and also the prescription medication. So what FDA is doing, they are also controlling that. So in order to have medication or to develop uh, the drug, uh, it's quite long process. You have to go through the research, you have to, there are different phases. Um, it's like phase one, two, and three three also that it's um, described here on the slide. So you have to uh, show also FDA the process and after the, the drug is developed on that specific level that is possible to do the clinical trials, then the clinical trials are done. But also it needs to go through IRB, which is the Institutional Review Board and consent form. So if the patient uh, or the participants are involved in the process, so they know, need to know about all possible positive effects and also the side effects or negative effects. So it takes quite time before uh, it's coming that uh, uh, type of the medication on the market. So it needs to mostly, um, they are checking also about the margin of safety of the drug, what is the tolerance, uh, what are the positive effects versus the side effects, are the positive effects higher, compare with the side effects. And then uh, even after this, it's going through that and uh, the drug is receiving the approval from FDA and it's going on the market. Uh, in the beginning, mostly 
where the medications go uh, through the prescription medication. So why prescription? Because, I mean, you also have better um, surveillance. You are checking, like, what are the effects, um, how, uh, if this is prescribed for many uh, patients, what are the effects? Is it really just that effect that we expect from the drug, or there are some additional uh, side effects? Uh, the FDA has the power uh, to take the drugs from the shelves. So if, and you probably have that experience uh, reading newspapers and uh, hearing like, well, this was the medication that was used for uh, decreasing blood pressure or decreasing cholesterol. And through the surveillance, it was possible to find out some side effects. And it's uh, the FDA, it's giving warning and taking that out of the shelves. Or sometimes the specific uh, uh, production, the specific year that uh, they found out there was maybe contamination. So they are immediately, you know, the FDA had the power to recall that, inform the public, taking that out of the shelves and giving information uh, based on that research, what was happening through the surveillance. Uh, if you have the prescription medication, it usually there is the time between three to five years that some of the prescription medication is allowed to be on that uh, uh, like over-the-counter medication. Uh, so it means it's available for the public. Usually what type of medication is available that they have very, very wide margin of safety. So even you are and you, everybody should uh, follow the instructions uh, about the dosage and about the consumption of the drug on the label, still the margin of safety is very, very wide. So uh, it's decreased the risk that uh, can be any some kind of additional side effects for the public. Usually some of that uh, drugs, uh, even they go through the prescription process, they are staying as a prescription medication because again, the margin of safety is quite narrow. And uh, the patient, because sometimes they are having quite strong effect and it's necessary to monitor the patient. So the FDA uh, is involved in that, so they are also involved in the labeling um, of that, what all information needs to be written on the drugs, but also they are involved whatever information needs to be written on the type of the food. Uh, so FDA was involved in that, that now you have the labels um, on the food and it's written there how much of the fat, how much of carbohydrates, protein, now more of the vitamins, so all of this uh, it's under the umbrella of FDA. So what do you think? Uh, should information about of, um, if um, uh, additional like technological approach was done with the food, if uh, you know they were involved in the process like uh, genetic modification? Um, so do you think that information should be done uh, also on the labels for the, uh, for the public? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's very important to have uh, this. We don't have yet this information done on the labels, but any kind of modification with the food should be uh, given also and should be added to the labels. Um, why, uh, so, again, here it's the challenges with the public health. And remember, now uh, something like when we talk about pasteurization, we think like, oh, it's of course, it's obvious. Now it's always written there, pasteurized. But in the beginning of the pasteurization, uh, the manufacturers or the companies that they were producing the products, the food companies, they didn't want to have that because they were thinking that they will be losing the profit and if the um, you know, consumer will see like, oh, it's pasteurized, they, will not, they don't want to buy that. So they were, there was, they, they were able to see like threat that maybe it was, uh, the, they will be decreasing the profit. So you as a public health provider, you need to do similar simultaneously two things. One thing is also educate public why it's important to have that information there or just about the pasteurization and about uh, foodborne illnesses and everything. So educate the public and on the other side, if the public is educated, so they will be also, they will realize like why I need or I have the choices why I'm buying the product. And uh, so that eventually there will be the balance in the profit for the uh, food industry also. There's some kind of form of of like genetically modify the food or cloned 
meat, especially that information like that, if the meat is uh, produced by cloning. So that also needs to be uh, written on the label. Why? Again, at this moment, you have so much challenges with the food industry because they are afraid of losing the profit and they would be thinking like, oh, if they will see like that meat was produced by the cloning or this food was the genetically modified, they will not buy that. Uh, but also if you think uh, from other perspectives from public health, it's very important um, for public to know that because they can have the choice. They can either buy this or other thing, but also in the long run, in case we don't know if uh, I mean it's it's connected with any type of uh, type of food or any type of the situations that maybe now at this moment we are not aware but in the future maybe there will be some type of the disease like now we have the mad cow disease so and it's connected with the type of the food that was given you know to the animals at the animal farm so we don't know if at this moment any um, changes in the production of the food could influence the health uh, of the population. So if, for example, 50 years from now, uh, there will be the disease and you would like to find out what is the correlation, what are the connection, and you will do, uh, you will do survey and you will ask uh, you know, the participants what uh, type of the food they were eating and uh, you know, all of that situations. And um, if there will be not information on the labels, you will not get any clue. Could be connected with maybe genetically modified food. Could be connected with any other things that the technology is bringing. Maybe not, but uh, that information is crucial, not just for the consumer to make the choices, whatever they want, but also from public health perspectives. So it's quite interesting in, man, in Japan and in many um, European countries, that label, if the food was what kind of technology was used with the food, it's on the label. It doesn't mean that it's bad or it's good, just to have the information. And because in case whatever in the future, we, we will ask the public and they will tell us, well, I was mostly consuming this type of food. I was consuming this, like the same, like now we are asking, what did you eat? Did you eat uh, packaged spinach? And there was the E. coli. So it's not giving any judgment or anything on that way, what the the technology is done with the food, but it's just having the basic, basic information because we never know in case we will need that and we can find the best preventative measures in that case if we will find any kind of association. So it's very important. Sometimes when you, you will be talking with uh, representatives uh, of different uh, companies, they will tell you they, they, they wouldn't be um, showing the openness in that uh, way that this information should be disclosed to the public. But you, from public health perspectives, you can tell them it's not uh, judgmental, but we just have to disclose that in order to know in case uh, how to provide any uh, treatment or preventative things in the future, if we will find some correlations of that. So that, uh, you know, even the example could be about the mad cow disease. So now suddenly how come? Why we have the... <clears throat> There's a disease with the dementia and uh, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, so it was necessary to go back. So it took a little bit longer time to find that, but uh, this is again, this information on the labels, it's important from public health perspectives. Okay? So I would like to let you know about this part. <clears throat> Dietary supplements. There are still a little bit problems with the ruling uh, with dietary supplements. Uh, FDA, it's still, uh, they are putting that to the section as a food, not as a drugs on its own. So therefore the regulations are a little bit different because the regulations for the drugs are quite strict. Uh, so it means that if the company are producing the specific drug uh, based on the FDA uh, rules also, it's important to know that yes, if there are 100 milligrams of this ingredient, the 100 milligrams of that ingredient is there, plus also of the safety precautions things, how the products is developed. So there are specific sanitation, hygiene, temperature, and all of that. 
this dietary supplements because it's still under the food uh, section so this specific strict rules doesn't apply so therefore sometimes it's still a little bit uh, conf confusion uh, I mean not, uh, not uh, public it's a little bit confused about the way like well if I am buying this dietary supplements do I really know that this amount is there is it a natural type of vitamin E or is synthetic uh, vitamin C uh, or uh, about the botanical medicine if we talk about the ginkgo biloba is this extract standardized and it's already there you probably notice now it's the um, way uh, to write there like specific extract standardization so they try through the botanical medicine to come to some specific rules on that it looks like uh, American Botanical Council will be probably dealing a little bit with specific regulations for uh, botanical medicine so we need a little bit more regulations in that way uh, there are few websites um, they are connected with the government sites also that they try to protect uh, the public in the way that they do also checking some of that uh, manufacturers uh, with the dietary supplements and they do from time to time checking like yes if it's written there like 500 milligrams just to do the laboratory test if it's true or not so they are giving like the clear green lights on some of the companies that yes we were checking and the amount is there because sometimes many times you are like surprised or public is surprised reading the research papers uh, about uh, extracts from bilberry for example and extract is working excellently and some you know uh, public is buying that and uh, buying the product and realizing maybe it's not the specific effect uh, on their house so it means that mostly always when the research is done with any type of dietary supplement so they have the laboratory <coughs> tests checking that yes this ingredient is there so it's almost guaranteed with every uh, research paper if they are using the extract extract like from turmeric for example there is specific amount yes it is there so <coughs> this is another way that USA future public health providers to do something about that, we have to completely be sure that whatever we are swallowing dietary supplements, that is exactly the amount that is written on the label. So there are the ways already in that there are uh, the um, agencies also trying to protect uh, the public. Uh, there are the links, I will post it also on the class website, I didn't do that, but there are the links that you can go there and you can check, yes, what you are buying if, uh, if they went through the laboratory tests and uh, if uh, that ingredients are what they are you know uh, uh, put that on the labels politics so this is sometimes uh, could be the problem uh, and we talk about that the public health is uh, challenge there are challenges and politics involved in that too what can happen when we talk about the politics um, with, um, with especially with this uh, topic is that sometimes you have the companies the pharmaceutical companies and they are thinking like wow it looks like everybody has problem with diabetes a lot of uh, uh, members of the public are having problems with high blood pressure high cholesterol level okay we we will concentrate on development of the tablets or medication for this because if we will develop something a little bit different it will be high profit because it's high uh, numbers in the population that they need to have this uh, medication so that's the politics in the way and that some of other diseases that still people are suffering from that but it's rare not uh, high you know in uh, uh, thousands and thousands of people are suffering from the disease so it looks like yes the pharmaceutical the company will think like oh we are not investing in that because it not will bring bring us uh, profit so how the FDA is helping in that way is also to having some specific um, rules or public health policy uh, that uh, they are trying and supporting some of that pharmaceutical companies that they decided yes we, uh, we don't have we cannot have high profit from that but we would like to do research and helping the small group of the public dealing with the disease because we will be doing Doing research in that way so there are some kind of different uh, laws uh, and um, uh, the policy that they are helping and balancing that level uh, 
another additional politics is uh, for approval. So of course, FDA is doing as much as possible to have all the uh, information uh, before they approve uh, that specific medication. Uh, sometimes the pharmaceutical companies are just uh, giving all the information, but not thinking like what in case some of that medication will be uh, misused uh, by the public or uh, from the medical community using in different way that was the intention. And one example was about the Fen Fen. I don't know if you remember that name, Fen Fen. It was quite popular around the 1999 and 2000. So Fen Fen was the, um, di uh, it was like a medication that was used for the weight management. Uh, it was based on increasing level of serotonin, the neurotransmitter, and it was prescribed by physicians, mostly the family uh, uh, medicine doctors, for uh, patients if they needed to be on the weight management program. Uh, it was originally scheduled to have that for the short period of time, maybe like for three months, with changing the lifestyle modification, doing more exercise and changing the eating style together, that eventually it will help like the, because it will, it, because of that serotonin, um, it's uh, changing the mood and changing uh, the, um, the approach of that patient and feeling better because they start to lose the weight. So it's like increased motivator and together with changing the lifestyle, it can lead to the healthy lifestyle. So that was originally a great idea about that. But uh, again, the public would like to have uh, like the magic bullet. <laughs> so they were thinking, okay, I will just take the fan fan and I will be not changing lifestyle modification. I will not change my diet, anything. So it was almost like not in the way of the psychology like getting addicted to the fan fan but uh, it happened that many people took that for one year two years and because um, there is higher uh, I mean uh, the fan fan it's based on that serotonin and of course if you have balance level of the serotonin that neurotransmitter it's everything balance in your life but if it's higher level of that that this um, medication will, can cause if you are using that for prolonged period of time it's doing also increase increasing blood pressure and increasing vasoconstriction. So if some um, um, people have problems with higher risk of cardiovascular disease or something that they were not aware about that, but it could be some problems with the heart um, or um, inborn uh, problems with the heart, that could have very detrimental sad effect uh, when they were using that and overusing that. So it actually happened that few people die uh, of uh, using too long the fan fan. So then the fan fan was taken also from the shelves. But if you think about it, it was a great idea to help that and probably if this was the proper way to use that, but it was misused again. So that's another thing very important that it's necessary if the product is going out uh, to the public to follow some regulations, but it was misused that. Uh, antidepressants for the children. So this is another uh, overuse of antidepressant. If you compare United States with other countries, so the prescription of antidepressant, it's much higher. So you as a public health providers could start to ask the questions, why, why is like that? Um, they also find uh, another thing is because it depends like what is the communication with the parents? What is the environment? What is that that um, do children have really enough time to play? to just play, to have the free time, or it's everything already scheduled in the way, like going to the school and just study, study, and everything like achievement, uh, achieving some of the way instead of being children and playing like that. So they found some research um, studies were showing that probably some of this part is missing so that we should check again a little bit more about lifestyle modification and decrease the prescription of antidepressant. Uh, sometimes some of the that medication is used for the attention deficit syndrome also. So how come now suddenly the children have more, is it because we do more diagnosis about that? Or is it because it's expected from the children in early age just to sit and listen instead of play and being as a child on their own? So 
uh, if you remember me, I was talking about the future, future uh, diseases that we will be dealing as a public health providers also. One will be, of course, diseases from physical inactivity. Uh, another will be probably not letting children to be children as they should be in the specific, uh, you know, uh, stages uh, in the childhood. And another one will be also a deficiency of uh, nature, so not being in the nature, not uh, being in connection and uh, you know spending time in the nature. So by the way, if I'm talking about that, how many of you, maybe I ask in this class, I'm just cla asking all my classes, um, how many of you spent um, maybe the few hours during the Thanksgiving to be in the nature? Go to the forest, go to the beach, just to be in the nature, how many of you? Please show that to me. I would like to see. Really be proud and show me the hands. One, two, three, four, five. Five from almost like what, 80? I, I know we don't have 100 students today, but can you imagine that? So uh, many of you didn't spend. So what did you do? Black uh, Friday? <laughs> uh, this is the nature. <laughs> so no, I'm joking about it. But yeah, so that can be the deficiency that uh, people will be not in contact with the nature because nature on its own, um, we are still not aware about the healing properties of the nature. So, and some research is showing if you don't spend enough time of the nature, that's the higher risk of the blood pressure, that's higher because it's the stress situation. So if you don't spend time in that uh, locations, um, there is higher risk of uh, development of the diseases. So this is another thing that we need to think about about FDA and pharmaceutical industry and lifestyle management. So, uh, discussion questions. Identify three or more or any type of the food contaminants. Uh, is uh, government doing something about that? Any ideas about contaminants or additives or anything that is added to the food? Yeah. So one of them could be, I'm gonna say, human waste um, expired or spoiled food and bacteria. Um, to prevent human waste contamination, the government says wash your hands after you go to the bathroom and do your food prep. And then for something like allergens, keep such things like peanuts and shellfish separate away from other types of food mm -hmm. that you're preparing. And for um, such things like expired waste product, keep an eye on um, the expiration date of the product and keep it away from fresher food. Okay, yes, thank you so much. So it's also like how, uh, how you organize your refrigerator. So it's also like very important if you have the sections for fruits and vegetables and the other. So that's some kind of or how you are, you know, uh, storing the food. So that's also a very important part that you can be involved, actively involved in the process. Uh, and expiration, yes, that's also very important because uh, in that time it can be done the contamination. Okay, so now we are going for the next chapter. Chapter 24. So now you are thinking like, oh, we are just moving from that to another very important topic uh, connected with public health. Some portion of that was already um, you were able to hear uh, during the uh, presentation, the guest speaker that we have, Dr. Bill Cooper. So population. So is there a problem if there will be uh, a, um, the pattern of population grow will be in this uh, style, the jail style, J, so it means it's going up and you were able already hear this, uh, yes, that will be the problem because there will be higher demand of everything, higher demand of water, uh, higher demand of all the resources uh, that uh, will be bringing the population. So if the population will be increasing that. Uh, if we look from the public health perspectives also is because uh, if, and it's very important we are from public health perspectives, extending the longevity, but we would like also to increase the uh, quality of life for the public. So it's not like longevity in the way and that the person will spend another 15, 20 years regularly, twice a week going and seeing the uh, physicians at the medical offices, because then of course there will be the burden of also on the whole system, but it will be good 
to have that healthy aging, so to uh, keep the population um, healthy and uh, in good quality of life. So uh, the, um, when we think about the population grow, so if you look on here like excess population, what can be happening? It can be problem with uh, keeping the public health infrastructure. So it will be sanitation, it will be hygiene, enough of the food. So there are many uh, things that can be connected if there will be the increase uh, the, in population. This slide is very, very important. I would like that you remember that. And if somebody will wake you up in the middle of the night, that you know about this. So what will happen with uh, overpopulation? There will be the <clears throat> uh, depletion of global resources. And I mentioned that and I touched that just a little bit before, but now you have the specifically connection with the fresh water. So um, if there is the problem with this, there is the problem with agriculture. There is the not enough of the food because uh, if it's not water, we cannot do, uh, do the production of the plant food and uh, there will be uh, not enough of the food. Uh, fuel, so on its own, that can be problem with this. Also, um, deforestation, so that can be changes and, uh, you know, problem with the land. Um, 2011, no, 2010, I was with UCI students in Costa Rica and we were doing the deforest, we were doing reforestation, reforestation on the coast. So going on that area and trying and to put the new little trees and uh, um, you know, the mangrove uh, uh, area. So giving the new uh, plants there. Because of, uh, of overpopulation, that coast and the mangrove trees are um, depleted and damaged. And mangrove, the area around the coast, it's also so protecting because it's uh, it's keeping the land uh, the way as it should be uh, and of course the food from the sea so that will be also a decline and we know that it's very important to have that uh, sea vegetables and the fish also because it's uh, omega-3 fatty acids and if we are not thinking about the fish but we are thinking about the sea vegetable and plus uh, the keeping healthy uh, the sea on its own if uh, the, um, uh, the life is uh, there Climate changes, I will be not spending so much on that because it was uh, explained to you by our guest speaker. So that will be a big, huge problem if there is the overpopulation. So that will be increase the temperature. And also another thing, if you were thinking about that, if there will be uh, changes in the climate, also there will be changes in the, um, uh, about the diseases. Because if you think about malaria, so malaria, it's connected with the area that it's very, very warm, it's humid, it's hot. Uh, some area, if just example, I will talk about Guatemala because I visited Guatemala almost seven years, um, always for one month during the summertime. And so I spent time in uh, Antigua. Antigua is because the Guatemala, it's also, it's hot, humid. Antigua, I don't know, any of you know, visited Antigua? Nobody. So it's beautiful Spanish city, suddenly in the Central America in Guatemala. Mm -hmm. And it's in the mountains. So when I was going there the first time, of course, I went through the CDC and checking uh, all of that uh, precautious things and vaccination and everything. And of course, uh, in many of the areas in Central America, you have to use the malarian tablet to prevent that you will not have the problems with malaria. So I checked with Antigua, but Antigua, they have no you know, problems with malaria because they are a little bit in the mountains. I mean, it's the mountain, they are a little bit up. Uh, they are like like one hour uh, drive from the um, Santiago and uh, I know Santiago, Guatemala City, sorry about that, Guatemala City. And uh, so there is no problem. But if they will start the global warming, the warm temperature will be moving. It will be going upper on that before that was protected uh, from malaria because it was a little bit in the mountains. Now the temperature will be changing and it will be getting warmer. So now suddenly the population living in that area will be surprised that never from the centuries was the risk with malaria because it was the natural protection done through the climate 
now suddenly the population will be exposed to that risk because it will be increased temperature and the mosquitoes will be moving. <laughs> mosquitoes will be going, uh, you know, where it's warm and the worm will be going there. So that's another thing that you have to realize that, that maybe new diseases can come uh, from this um, warming because it will be suddenly changes, it will be change the environment um, for that uh, pathogens or the vectors like for the mosquitoes so they will be able to transfer the disease. Uh, when we talk about control, so that's again it's public health policy, there are different development the, uh, acts, programs, um, uh, there are conferences, uh, all the nations are getting also together because now when we talk about the environment, it's not just connected with one of the nation because it will influence on the general level. Oh, okay, I was surprised. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, discussion questions. Uh, can you um, know about public health measure that was discussed and how these measures can increase or decrease the population growth? Or if it was not discussed but you were thinking that could be some uh, forms that can decrease. The guest speaker was talking about the China policy. So that was like recommending, you know, to one child per family. Uh, sometimes uh, it's, I mean, of course, even if you do some policy like that, it can be quite hard from the cultural perspectives uh, for that population, because especially in the China, it was very common to have more children because the children were actually like the so-called like uh, from the traditional and historical point as a health insurance and as an insurance for the parents because in the time if the parents were old the children were actually taking care of the parents so now suddenly if the policy is only one child so it was very very hard for that cultural aspects also it was very common to have uh, the boys so the boys were very impo important to be born in the family because they were taking of the family business now suddenly what will happen if the policy is only one child but it's born the girl. So in the beginning uh, it, when it was established this policy so it was uh, quite um, uh, possible to find out that maybe um, the parents abandoned their children if they were as a girl as they were born and they tried to show that yes we don't have the children yet we have you know we have to have the child or what happened in one village that suddenly in that one village, the women have uh, two, three, or four children. So they have like triplets or quadruplets or all of that. So they were thinking, how come through one birth to be born so many children? So they found out because uh, if they were, uh, the policy was to have one child or one, uh, you know, live uh, alive birth, uh, one uh, delivery, the birth or, uh, for the pregnant woman. So they try to take the um, medication that is used uh, for infertile uh, women uh, or the couple that they cannot have children. So it was the promoting um, the hormonal, um, uh, hormonal changes that there was the possibility to have more children. So they found out that in one of village they were doing like this. So the women were trying to find a way like how to have more children. So to, through one of the uh, one births uh, that the children, they, they have that. So, so you can see it's, it's just, it's, sometimes it needs to be also a little bit sensitive uh, to the cultural aspect uh, and uh, that we will be not surprised and find some additional you know, barriers or obstacles uh, in the culture. Uh, actually, uh, on the policy, the China policy was, uh, they were not punished, of course, if they have more children, but if they have only one child and it was the policy to have one child, they have some incentives from the government. If they have two children, they didn't have the incentives. So it was not like, oh, if you, you have two children, you are in the jail. <laughs> so it's not in that way, the policy, but the policy was, if there was one child, they have um, incentives that was very, very good. So if that was the family that in the villages and the lower social economic situation, so they wanted to follow that because it was financially helping them from the government. Uh, <clears throat> then also when you go back, uh, just um, 
experience also uh, from this policy or how this needs to be sometimes changed a little bit or modified. Uh, you are uh, aware about that earthquake that was in China, uh, I think it was a few years ago, and it also happened that it was the collapsing of the school and many children die in that. So during the time the government was telling women like yes because if you have only one child and that child died during the earthquake when the child was at school uh, you can have you know if you would like to have the child uh, you you would like to be the pregnant you will also receive the incentives from the government so that was change based you know on that situation on that specific um, uh, problem so now so that was the chapter 24 and now we are moving to um, chapter 25 uh, about the medical system and then I would like to show you the video clip after that so uh, is the medical care system a public health issue what do you think about that yeah of course yes therefore we are talking about that also um, so we still need to have, because sometimes people would think like, well, if it's public health only and we do all the preventative things, we don't need to have medical care on its own or how they work together. So it's very, very important. We always need, even we do a lot of preventative things and uh, when we talk about injuries, so you can do many of the preventative things, but uh, we need to use also the uh, the medical model to work together with the public health model so even if you will be keeping uh, the healthy modification and you are involved in the primary secondary tertiary prevention uh, there are of course situations that uh, uh, they need to be cooperation together so what is the medical care part of that it's of course uh, if there are the injuries and uh, now I mean you did as much as possible to prevent that but if it's the situation and it needs to be dealing with the injury you need to have the medical model uh, similar situation with uh, if you apply the immunization but that could be the side effect of that or uh, it happened that the child was not properly immunized or it's not immunized so what is the uh, the medical care on its own so the best thing is the best uh, approach for the public is the cooperation working together as a public health and medical care on its own but if you look on that slide so it's like the medical care so explaining because some people could tell like well we don't need to have that we just have the public house sometimes it's confusing in that way uh, it's the best way it's to see that together and also see like what is the medical um, care on its own uh, why we need to have that uh, when is medical care a public health responsibility? So it's mostly uh, if there are, uh, you know, uh, prevention of the spreading of the diseases, emergency services. Uh, so all of that are the part of the public health. So it's very, very close together, but some specific things like if we talk about the veterans, for example. So it, uh, you know, based on that system about the health insurance, maybe not all veterans will qualify based on that uh, system. Now it's changing because this um, with the uh, government approach uh, to that um, system, to the health insurances. But if we think about the veterans, so that's the public health issue. We have to establish and help them to have that uh, veteran uh, medical care system that uh, the, uh, the public will be treated there. Uh, so what, uh, uh, what is the medical care, how it's paid in US? So what are the different uh, things that uh, the public is you know, having that health insurances? Um, we will be talking a little bit more about that in public health too, uh, that you will go and see the examples from different countries, what kind of system they are. Um, if we think about, the, and it's now changing also uh, the healthcare system through the, the government now, 
now that is uh, the way that everybody should have that house insurance. It shouldn't be just depending on pre-existing conditions and based on that somebody is receiving the uh, house care, uh, house insurance or not. So there are changes in that. Uh, the few organizations that we have, uh, like Medicare, so that's the system that is used. Uh, it's um, insurance uh, for uh, uh, Medicare on its own. It's like if you are uh, 65, uh, if the person is 65 uh, and they are, um, you know, they are disabled, so they can apply for the Medicare. So it's helping like older population to have the proper way of that health insurance. Medicaid, it's a welfare program for the poor, so it's also supported uh, by the government. Licensing regulations, uh, you would be thinking like, oh, what is the involvement of public health there? Yes, you, have, you are also part of this. Uh, you can see the abbreviation here. It's the Joint Commission on Accreditation of Healthcare Organization. So yes, you also, as a public health provider, you are going to the hospitals and checking uh, the regu if the hospital is following the regulations, if they are keeping the charts for the patients. Uh, if uh, and sometimes there are reports, of course, that there are some mistakes that are happening in the hospital. So you would like um, to check and minimize any uh, problems like that in the hospitals. So usually they have also accreditation for six years and after six years also that uh, the whole commission is going there and committee and checking uh, the regulations, what the hospital is doing about that. Sometimes they have the permission to continue, uh, but they have to um, everything what was what uh, was possible to find out. It's not proper way that they follow. They need to minimize that. Uh, now a little bit talking about ethical and legal issues in medical care. So talking about abortion, assisted suicide, right to die. Any comments? Uh, maybe you heard about that. Do you think it's part of the public health provider? Public health provider should be involved in that process. Of course, it, uh, they have to be because it's very important about the quality of life for the public. So uh, there are a little bit still changes and regulations about the, uh, the abortion. If you think there are some countries, when I was back 2011 with um, UCI students, we traveled to Chile. And in Chile, the abortion is illegal completely. So it's no way, even whatever reasons, uh, nothing is accepted. It's completely illegal. So if you think about that from the public health perspectives, is it possible? Is it improving the quality of life of the public uh, doing uh, illegal things like that? Probably not, because we have to think like what was happening is the higher risk for the mother is the risk for the child. Do we need to do medical level of the abortion? There is just like abortion that's not allowed whatsoever. So it's uh, in Chile, it's no way do that. So. Uh, here it's public house coming in that way that we have to, if you do that completely as illegal, it doesn't mean that will not happen, it will, and before it was legalized, it was also illegal, um, the abortion, and many, many women die during the time of the sepsis because of not proper sanitation and hygiene and everything. So it's always uh, very important, of course, to do as much as education as possible that is not necessary to have that abortion, but if that situation is here, that should be, you know, uh, allowed uh, to have that uh, in the proper uh, medical setting with uh, all the precautions and prevention of the sepsis. It's, it shouldn't be something that was done during the communist system in uh, Soviet Union, that abortion was the uh, process for the, um, uh, it was uh, used for, um, uh, as a contraceptive method. So there were women, they were having abortions maybe five, six, seven times in the life because it was used as a um, you know, contraceptive method. So instead of uh, using that if it's medically necessary to have that or whatever situation, it's uh, necessary to do that. So any comments for that? 
Yeah, so it needs to be again both things. It needs to be done education, but also if the situations happen, it needs to be uh, keeping the good quality of the public so that uh, that uh, public is not get, uh, you know, dying from that or having sepsis because of not proper procedure. Assisted suicide. I know they are very hard topics, so uh, any of this is, but it's part of the public house. So it's necessary to talk about that, it's necessary to do education to the public. The assisted suicide, it's quite controversial also topic. Uh, the sit and again, if you look on that, the public house, it's not black and white. It's something in the middle of that. So assisted suicide started in the way that if the uh, some people were sick, that uh, they were terminally sick and not just with the cancer but like amyotrophic lateral sclerosis so that's the disease that you are losing the ten uh, the tone of the muscles and actually the person is alive and through the being alive they are suffocating and they are dying from not able to breathe so so there are different type of diseases that something that the person knew about that it uh, it was sure that that disease is there was a diagnosis there was no way to treat the disease so that was the prevention of the suffering so some people decided to go for the assisted suicide so that was the first movement in that direction so again uh, you need to go and find out um, is, is it like um, a few months ago they were writing there was some kind of clinic in Switzerland doing assisted suicide so uh, the person just registered going there and going through the process so something like that it's probably not for the public health for the improving the quality of life what they do for example other countries like Denmark so if there is the process so usually it it takes like the whole one year the person is discussing with the members of the family with the physician knowing about the disease and uh, discussing and preparing through the whole process because if this is, there are some type of the diseases that uh, like I mentioned to you this one uh, with about the suffocation during the process when you are still alive so so the the person can have a slow process and decision knowing with all the members of of the family and with the physician so they have the specific regulations they have the specific form and it takes time so again um, that's uh, another thing that came out should we do that probably because of that you know improving the quality of life of the public so other specific situation like that or should we do immediately like illegal and that's it or should we talk about that and finding some kind of the uh, specific rules or regulations that it can help some uh, group of population. Of course, I mean, on other side, it can be any of that things could be misused. We have to be aware about that. Therefore, it's very important to discuss that and prepare some forums and some regulations and public health policy about that. Because, you know, assisted suicide could be also misused in case uh, that can be um, uh, the topic about the money. So that's that can be misused in the way that maybe be some members of the family would like to have the money and just dealing with the person and uh, pushing the person to something situation like that so we have to be aware about that but the thing is like should we do immediately illegality or should we be thinking like can this help uh, to uh, to some people and we have to do specific you know regulations right to die so again, uh, when you will be as a public health provider, and maybe some of you will be working on the ethic uh, committee, this is very hard. Uh, even I am public health provider, uh, it will be hard for me to work in that because it's the ethic committee you will learn in public health too. It's the committee um, with, um, there are many people involved in that, of course, public health provider, nurses, physicians, but also uh, people from that, uh, from the community. And uh, now they are, they just need to write or dis not decide because usually the decision is on that, uh, on that family or connection with the family. But uh, sometimes it's, uh, there was one situation that uh, a couple of years ago, it was the Supreme Court was making decisions and listening from both sides about uh, continuing uh, in that um, 
persistent vegetable state or not. So it's it's very very hard decisions about that, and uh, you cannot have completely rules like yes it needs to be stopped or not. Uh, it must put all the information together. Usually, it's the last decision is on the members of the family, but uh, you have to go through all that uh, you know situations and explain that. So this is something that we cannot run from that as a public health provider. In, instead, uh, we have to much more think like, is it some group that can help them? Is it some group of the public that can be controversial? It can be misused. How can I prevent that will be not misused? But how can I do something that it will help if it should help? So that's the public house, you know, to thinking about that. Uh, yeah, so you will, that's another um, situation like how to deal uh, with um, some other um, health problems and uh, uh, here is one about the chemotherapy in children. So I don't know if you are aware, it was a couple of years back also talking about the, uh, if you have child that, uh, I mean, it's not yet 18 years old, so, and it's the regular uh, approach to cancer is the chemotherapy. And the parents, actually in that time, the mother, uh, well, post parents, they wanted to use alternative medicine. And uh, this was in the time, it was like in the beginning of integration integrative medicine and some of you are in my class of integrative medicine now we have uh, the degree of naturopathic medicine physician and so on but so in that time they wanted uh, they decided not to use the chemotherapy for that young children the child was probably six year old and they wanted to alternative medicine but um, so this was something that that uh, medical model was not accepting and telling that uh, will be the harm to the child so the child needs to go because it was the standard procedure. So in that time, the mother was just, um, you know, she just was um, uh, trying to left uh, that location and she went for the hiding because she was like persecuted that that is the crime that uh, the child should be treated by the chemotherapy and not other things that were not as a standard uh, approach, so it was not recognized. You, after 18 years of old, you have that right, you know, to uh, refuse that treatment, or you can have um, uh, different approaches from integrative medicine. But in that time, if it's like less than 18 years old, the treatment with the chemotherapy was something what was standardized and what is the best interest uh, from the government approach. So this was quite kind of conflict <laughs> how to deal with the situation. Uh, so eventually it was solved that they were able, they saw the experts in integrative medicine. So the integrative medicine um, representative, they presented uh, the situation with the different type of the approach uh, that was also valid, that was justified, that was done from the research. And uh, so this was hearing about that and they allowed the child to have that. But it was a long process. It was lost so many of that days and months and no therapy was done with the child. So this is again, there are many, many different situations that is necessary uh, from public health perspectives to think about that and uh, dealing with that. You cannot close the eyes on that and let it go like that because uh, it's the public health. So you have to work in that uh, benefit of um, population. Okay. And kidney uh, dialysis or transplants. This is also, I mean, it's public health uh, problem. How to deal with that situation? Who should be receiving the transplants? Is there any specific rules? Uh, sometimes there is the waiting list. Some other uh, states decided, well, if uh, the donor or of the, if the donor, if the situation happened that the person who is waiting for the transplant is very close where uh, the donor happened situation or something, so maybe even if the person is not on the first on the list, but the transport is very quickly possible to do. It's the minimal minimizing the side effects because it's long transportation and everything. So the person will have the transplant. So you can see there are many of different things that it's connected with public health and you need to deal with that and uh, develop uh, you know different rules and policy or some kind of uh, judgment on the local level what can be good for improving the quality of uh, health of the public okay 
So I know I can see the time for you on your face. So I'm letting you to go under one condition. Smile. I would like to see smile on every face. Okay, remember improving immune system for that few minutes. Doing the breathing of fresh air and walking.